Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. In this episode, we're going to be talking to Natasha Knox. Natasha is a financial planner, uh, but as you'll see here, or here as the case may be, uh, she has a very heavy focus on financial therapy and really brings a lot of financial therapy learnings into her uh, financial planning practice. Uh, this episode will be good for uh, life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, uh, no accident and sickness credits in Alberta. Uh, we'll also have a financial planning credit from FP Canada and a professional development credit from IROC as well as the normal IAS credit. Okay, um, the object for today's episode, no longer we're doing uh, colors, now we're doing objects. So something pulled from the shelf behind me and actually you'll see it's partner just over here. There we go. Um, this is my granddaughter's favorite. This is a little uh, flower, a little pink flower that gives a little color to my office. And it has this little like wire hanger stick in it so you can hang it from anywhere. So when she comes over, she'll point to it and say grandpa, and then I'll fetch it down and she'll go hang it somewhere or jab her brother with it or some such. The um, episode here, we cover quite a bit of ground, and what I really enjoyed here is Natasha brings, I think, some very practical items from how she interacts with her clients, uh, sort of shows how that practice of financial therapy really informs her financial planning practice. And even though this is our second member of the Financial Therapy Association that we've had on recently, the other being Nate Assel about uh, a month and a half or so ago, quite a different interview. Uh, Nate really comes from a therapy-informed practice. And this is what I find interesting about the, in, about the uh, FDA is you have therapists, and Nate really is a therapist. Um, and although, as you heard Natasha mentioned, he's working on some financial planning stuff as well. Whereas Natasha really comes from that financial planning background. And it's something you see that's really an interesting dynamic when you go to FDA events is this uh, overlap between the uh, sort of therapy side and the planning side. And then you also get to see the, the big disconnects between the two. So something to watch for. And I really do encourage you, if you're not a member, uh, go to one of their lunch and learns or that kind of thing. You'll find it's really quite useful. All right, let's hear what uh, Natasha has to say. Okay, I'm joined today by Natasha Knox. Natasha is a uh, financial planner, financial coach, I think financial therapist shows up in there too. Natasha, I'm interested to hear this. Can you give a little bit of background about yourself and your practice? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so um, I guess the way to describe me is um, I usually just go by my professional designation. So I'm a financial planner. And what I do is I take um, sort of a coaching um, approach to the financial planning process. So I integrate it um, by design all throughout the financial planning process. And then I also layer in some therapeutic techniques. So that's where the financial therapy comes in. But usually I just refer to myself as a financial planner because most people have heard of it. So that's me. So can you talk about, I know you carry CFP certification. Can you talk about the other uh, designations or uh, postgraduate or that kind of thing, work that you've done to amplify that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am um, a, a certified financial behavior specialist through the uh, Financial Psychology Institute. Um, and also prior to that, I did my um, graduate certificate in financial therapy through Kansas State University. So there are a few institutions sort of worldwide, they all seem to be in the US at the moment um, that are offering financial therapy. Um, uh, Kansas State is one, Creighton is another, um, Golden Gate is another, and uh, University of Georgia is another. Um, I didn't know about Kate, the Golden Gate one, but that's good to know, thanks. Yeah. 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 Okay, and you started off, I think, in a MFDA shop and sort of graduated into working on your own. Do I have that right? Yeah, I did. Um, so I sort of, I think I had known for a little while that it was not the right fit for me. I didn't know what was wrong. You know, I, I didn't know, um, I didn't realize the degree to which the conflicts of interest that are inherent in the business model that I was under were affecting me. 
Um, also, I, I didn't know that financial therapy existed. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I suffer from insomnia. So, and, and combined with that, I have some of the most boring internet search habits in the world. My husband teases me all the time. So I was actually Googling something at like three o'clock in the morning when I couldn't sleep. And I came across financial therapy because what does one do when they can't sleep? I guess they Google, you know, like, how do I help my clients with financial counseling? And I found something about financial therapy, which led me to find the Financial Therapy Association and um, the Kansas State Program. So that was the only one I found at the time. Um, and, and I found out that it was available online. Um, and uh, it was it was a little while before I actually decided, yes, I'm going to do this. But that sort of got me started thinking about it. Okay, perfect. And yeah, I'm, I'm interested then in your work with the Financial Therapy Association and other like beyond the 3 a.m. Googling experience. <laughs> Uh, sort of how has that progressed for you? Yeah, so um, it's definitely been um, a, a gradual thing. Um, one of my profs at K-State was uh, involved with the FDA on the board. And so she encouraged all of us to get involved with the FDA, which I did basically immediately. I was still in the middle of my program. I threw my hat in the ring to start volunteering on one of the committees, the social media committee. I started getting to know people. And then the next year, um, I threw my hat in the ring uh, to be on the board. And then the following year, um, our, the chair of business development left. And so they asked me to chair that committee. Um, it's, been, it's been amazing, really. Um, the work that we do, like it's just something I'm really committed to. And the group of people is, um, they're all super committed. It's, it's volunteer run, essentially. Um, so everyone there is just doing it because of their belief in financial therapy and, you know, how it can help. And we're all very, very different in our practices. So. Um, right. It's, yeah, it's very multidisciplinary, stress. right? I know yes. I had uh, Nate Assel on about two months ago yeah. and he's really like purely operating from a therapy side. He is, he is. And um, even though he understands finances and I think going to be getting his CFP soon, actually, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's pretty busy, but I think he's that's on the horizon for him. I don't want to speak for him, but <laughs> right. um, so all of us are, you know, those of us coming from the financial side are very quickly developing our therapeutic skill set and vice versa. Those on the therapy side are developing a fairly robust um, financial skill set, even though our practices will always feel quite different. So, you know, the experience of working with Nate would be very different from working with me. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's not surprising. It, you know, when I, when I attend the FTA events, you get questions from like those therapist folks and you yeah. get questions from the financial planners. And then I think you almost kind of fit in between there, right? I think you're like on a spectrum, you're like, I don't know, whatever it is, maybe like 80% financial planner and 20% therapy. Or Do you think about that kind of thing? Well, kind sure? of, like what I'm trying to describe myself, I sort of try to think about that. And so if you consider, you know, like maybe one end of the spectrum being, I don't know, like an actuary or something, and then, you know, the other end of the spectrum being full on, you know, you know, I don't even know what the other end would be the equivalent, but, you know, doesn't talk about numbers at all ever. Most of us are already at least 20% in, you know, and I would say even most, what I'll call like maybe a traditional financial planner is going to be some, a little bit in and it's getting more and more in now. I think there's a lot of recognition. Um, FB Canada has their uh, program that is uh, helping advisors develop, you know, um, you know, an, an exquisite listening skill set. And so it's definitely shrinking those boundaries. And then in the FTA, we're even closer. There are some people who are fully in the middle, yeah. but I, I wouldn't say I'm fully in the middle. I'm still on, on the financial side, but I'm, I'm getting closer to the middle. I'm just curious here, you mentioned the uh, FP Canada program. Um, have you looked at that seriously? Um, I've taken one module of it. I haven't, I haven't investigated it in super depth, so I wouldn't be able to comment. I, it's just, it's a recognition of the, um, of the trend in the industry. And I think the recognition of this is sort of the next frontier of how to 
really help clients in a meaningful way. And um, I think that there's a, an increased awareness of how our decision making is very emotionally based and how, you know, it is not based on logic. And in fact, you know, sometimes logic can create some resistance and people will dig in their heels and it creates the opposite effect. And we're, we're seeing that, like, like we're, we're beginning to understand why that is now. Yeah, I, I'm really happy. I don't know if you've looked at it or not, but the uh, body of knowledge from FB Canada was significantly revised in 2019. Yeah. And in fact, that idea of not convincing with logic, which comes straight out of, I want to say that's Brad Klontz's work originally, but that's uh, that that's now in there, right? So you learn that, yeah. you know, you can't hammer somebody into thinking a certain way with an Excel spreadsheet, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, now... In your practice, then you said you sort of you see yourself mostly on the financial planning side, but kind of graduating to the more therapeutic side. How do you sort of present that engagement to a client? That is, do, do clients have to have this sort of breakdown explained? Do they come to you expecting a financial planner with, you know, robust like Excel and and I know you're capable of doing all that stuff, but how do you sort of explain the value you provide to a client? Oh, that's a tough question. I, I'm still learning how to explain my value. My clients are way better ex at explaining my value back to me okay. than I am at explaining my value. Um, so, and, and the thing is, is that I still do robust financial planning. It's just my starting place is a little different, I think. And um, my process looks a little different. So, you know, um, or it, it can look a little different. So even in the initial intake, um, before um, before I even meet with them for the first time, um, I have a pre-discovery intake. So I just sort of have a general idea of where they're coming from. And there's a little slider on it that sort of says like, what approach would be the most helpful for you? And on one side of the slider, there is facts and numbers. And then the other slide is mindset. And so people can slide it. So I already know, you know, so they know okay, we can sort of be somewhere on this spectrum and uh, they're sort of letting me know what, what they're wanting from the relationship. So if someone says facts and numbers, then that's what they get. Okay. And do you have uh, an average here? Do you know where people sit or is it all over the map? Um, it, it, it has to do with how they find me. Okay. You know, so so if they found me through, you know, a certain publication, for example, that tends to attract a readership of a particular um, perspective, that um, if you're familiar with Brad Quantz's work, they'll be very money, money vigilant, you know, they've made good solid decisions for themselves, they do a lot of research, um, you know, they maybe follow this particular publication because, you know, they like to keep on top of things and, you know, educate themselves, they have a high degree of financial literacy, they may be selecting facts and figures, please. Okay. Right. And people who found me in other ways through a referral or maybe a Google search or in a directory that's a bit more financial psychology or financial therapy specific, maybe they are leaning more toward the other side. That makes sense. And of course, you'd be one of the few Canadians that shows up on the FTA directory, for example, right? That's Yeah, yeah. Although that is changing as well. Um, yeah. I think that more and more people are just learning about the directory and uh, adding themselves to the directory. But as far as I know, I'm currently the only Canadian on the directory. I'm not the only person in Canada who does this oh. work. I'm, you know, there are other people who do this work in Canada. Um, yeah, but I'm sure that I know when Edmonton member, although I don't think he's doing any financial therapy work. So that might be. Oh, I, I think I know who you're talking about. You can edit this out, but like, uh, I think it's Sean. And yeah, uh, yeah. 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 I, I'm not sure how he runs his practice, but his podcast is, you know, he's had some great guests as well. Yeah. yeah I, his practice is still, uh, let's say, a traditional um, financial advisory or financial planning type of practice. So, yeah. Oh. And, and I think that's okay to leave that in there. We didn't even go with the last name on that. There so. we go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I have talked about his podcast on this before. So yeah, yeah I think we're okay. Um, so with your clients then, I assume then because you say you're really still doing financial planning engagement. So I assume you don't have 
many clients where they would come to you with an acute problem? Or do you find that they come with an acute problem and then it sort of graduates into a long-term problem? I, I'm sort of interested in this, uh, you know, how much of the, let's say, people who come on that uh, that therapy side or the like uh, money mindset side, how much of that is about acute problem solving? Um, I, I would say it's about more like chronic problem solving um, rather than necessarily an acute problem. So if someone has an acute problem, like for example, um, if I look at their household cash flow, like I'll know right away, like if they need to talk to me or if, for example, they need an insolvency trustee, right. you know, or, um, you know, someone recently reached out to me where what they were describing was actually that they needed a therapist, you know, and so I'm not a therapist on that. And I know I'm not a therapist and I, you know, and, and I make that really clear. And so, you know, and this person said, actually, I think you're right. Thank you. You know, so. In that case, did you refer a therapist or did they go off on their own and find a therapist? Um, that particular person was already on the wait list for a therapist. Okay. So, um, so yeah, in, in that particular case. So sometimes I do refer a therapist, um, absolutely, when I think it's called for. Although interestingly, um, many of my clients who come to see me already have a therapist in their lives because I think there's something about within the self-selection process so that if you're open to a business like Alafia, you know, and you go through the website and you see what it's all about, you know, there is some part of that person that is already open to working with someone in that way. So it's interesting. Many of my clients are also, you know, they, they have their own therapists and it's all part of their personal work. And the work we do together sort of amplifies what the therapist is doing and vice versa. Yeah. I'm going to include the link to your website, the Alafia website in the show notes for today. Uh, that's a great website. I'm curious to know, um, how much work it does for you? Is it a useful um, place for people to find you or is it sort of a way to explain your services to clients? Yep. What's, the, what's the benefit of that, uh, that website? Um, it's both. It, it, it's both. Um, it's actually a fairly new website. Um, I went through a significant brand overhaul, including a name, like basically like root to, root to, leaf or <laughs> overhaul. I don't know what the expression is. Yeah. Um, brand name, everything. It's not, there's nothing that is the same as it was before. Um, and that new site, new name, everything was launched at the end of May and it has been tremendous. Um, so there's sort of an education piece um, that just kind of gets people understanding how this can work, you know, or even that such a service exists. So Sometimes people, I, I don't, you know, I try to find out how people find me. I don't even know how people find me sometimes, but, you know, I often get the comment, oh, I didn't know that this kind of service existed. So there is an educational piece, even if they don't come to see me, they may at least now know, okay, this can be done. Someone out there is doing it. Um, there is the explanation of this is what I do. I think it represents what I do fairly well, you know, and as far as being searchable, you know, I, I have no idea. I, I'm listed in a couple of places. I think most of my traffic comes through there. It's been, um, I haven't really worked on SEO or any of that yet. Now, just circling back to the working with the therapist or referring to the therapist here. This is something we talk about in class and it's sort of a difficult conversation for people who have never done it, right? This idea that you're working with a client, they came to you expecting sort of financial planning advice, right? And now you're going to say, all right, client, I'm not the right person to help you. You have to go to a therapist. And I think the concern people have is they're, it's almost like they're kind of judging the client's mental health or some version of that. And, and I, I'm going to say, I'm going to use bad language here to say like something like the interpretation here is, client, you're too messed up for me to help you. You got to go to this other person, right? And I know you, but that, I think that's the impression that some people have when they uh, talk to the client about, you know, going to a mental health professional, for example. So can you talk a little bit about how that conversation goes and maybe some tips around that? 
Well, for me, it starts with the engagement letter. So the engagement letter outlines my qualifications. It also outlines very clearly, I am not a therapist. This is my training. The, the, these are the kinds of interventions I use. And if we start to approach areas where I don't have the necessary qualifications, I'm going to refer you. Because I think um, the important thing is for the clients to understand and um, for the advisor to understand is that the client's safety is the number one priority. And so practicing outside of one scope of competence, you know, puts them at risk of harm. And so I approach it from that aspect of, I, you know, it, it's not that you're messed up. It's that someone with a different skill set is going to be more qualified to help you navigate this, you know, well, right. you know, like, like they can help you. Like, so the client's not messed up, but they could become messed up if I start working in areas where I'm not good. competent. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, and that's very that's a very therapy driven approach, right? That do no harm. That's uh, like yeah. that's one hundred percent out of the world of therapy, right? Yeah. Um, now, you have some good case studies on your website. Yeah. I'm hoping you can talk through some of the engagements you've had where you've been dealing in, let's say, that non traditional financial planning area, and how you've uh, achieved success, or how your clients have achieved success based on that work is, is, do you have some case studies that are useful here? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I'm just trying to think of a way that I can describe them that is, you know, confidential. Um, so one of the areas I work with is um, overspending. And so my clients tend to have be like high income. They may not be high net worth, but they're high income. So um, one of the reasons that I would say my approach is fairly successful actually has nothing to do with me. Um, it's because the clients are ready. When they come to see me, you know, we, we do the initial process, they sign the engagement letter, like, like those are all signs of readiness to make change. Like they've already come to a part point in their lives where they're like, ah, this isn't working anymore. I've got to make a change. So that is, you know, like that is the first recipe, like first ingredient in success is their own readiness to start doing that work and make the change. And then they're hiring me because they want to work in this kind of special way. So I can't even really take credit 100% for, you know, the progress that they're making because it's really, it's really their own adaptability that is facilitating, you know, my ability to be able to support them. Um, and, um, oh golly. Where was I going with this? What was your question? Well, I'm so I sorry. Think, so the, the case study. So then, you know, this is good. The spend yeah. the client who sort of perceives that they have a spending problem and they're willing to actually fill yeah. out the form on your website or however yeah. and engage with you on that. So now how do you get from that? Because it's not like that's not an easy thing. Even that person who says I'm ready to change. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of work that goes into it, whether it's your okay. work or the client's work. Yeah. And so my, my, um, my particular practice is a very low client caseload, high intervention okay. practice. And so I'm sort of, it's sort of designed in a way to be able to give that sort of intensive support in the early change days, which is, I think, the other main ingredient of success. So, um, you know, I set the expectation, again, in the engagement letter of a meeting cadence of about once a week. And that can continue for the first couple of months. Because when you're making these kinds of changes, it is, no one is going to change or like, you know, like really overhaul their life if they're only seeing me once a quarter, right? So there is, there's an accountability piece of it, but there's also a troubleshooting piece. There is also, you know, um, there's the exercises and then the feedback on the exercises and, you know, conversations around what emerges from some of the therapeutic exercises and uh, challenges that they've come up throughout the week that we then talk about and work through. So that consistent meeting cadence in the early couple of months is what sort of allows some momentum to build. And then, you know, it's pretty evident, um, you know, if it's overspending or if it's financial anxiety or, you know, if it's friction between the two, it's, it's very evident in the meetings when the changes are starting to happen. 
the kind of exercises you're talking about, is this stuff you came up with or do you have a, a package you bought from somewhere? What sort of tools do you use to help out? Uh, so I use a combination of assessments and different exercises. Some of them I have um, uh, found in the um, facilitating financial health, some of the, uh, which is a classic um, book that everyone, everyone okay. should have it. And so, you know, there's some exercises that I like more than others. Most of them I've sort of developed and put my own spin on or sort of extended um, to, you know, I, I, I always, I, I can't help tinkering. So, <laughs> so I've sort of like adapted them in a way that I like to use them. Um, I've developed a few different exercises and inventories of my own. Um, you know, the KMSI is, you know, the classic inventory that, you know, everyone is allowed to use as long as they give proper attribution. So I have a particular way that I use it. And if I can just take a quick sidebar here. Yes. I do not use it to categorize people into four groups ever. Yeah. Right. Like, so that is not a thing in my practice. It is not something that I'll say, oh, you client are fitting nicely into the money avoidant box. That's not right. Um, one of my um, classmates at uh, K-State described it as a choir, as voices in a choir. Right. And I think that is such a beautiful and eloquent description of money scripts is that, you know, we all have these voices, like we all have this choir and some of those voices are gonna be more dominant for other, some of us. And also at different parts during the piece or different triggers and different things in our lives will cause certain voices to become more dominant. But it's it's a choir, it's not a box. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I've never been, and I know this is not gonna be popular with some of the folks listening. I've never been a fan of, uh, whether it's that kind of thing or Colby or whatever of, of putting people into boxes. Cause I find it does vary so much yeah. depending on, like you say, the, you know, it might be the setting you're in. It might be how your, your mood is in a particular day. There's a lot, lots of things that, that uh, change that, it, you know, and I, I, I would think that my, like my approach to parenting, for example, is different than my approach to teaching classes or, you know, that, that, and even running a business, right? When that used to be a concern for me. So yeah, I, I've i always felt that. I, I still really, I did the KMSI and I have updated a couple of times. I really like it. The KMSI yeah. sorry, is Klontz Money Scripts Inventory. And, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry for the yeah, acronym. <laughs> all good, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I like it because it gives you that introspection, right? It really yeah. is. And I'm sure that people come back and tell you that just filling it out was a useful exercise. It is. It is. And it's it's a great conversation starter. It is not an end point in and of itself. Um, another um, early inventory that I like to use was yanked from a paper, something to do with money grams. Um, I, I can email it to you if that's okay. And you can add it, add the paper. So I've created an inventory based on that paper. I've added a few questions to myself and I use that as a, an initial intake assessment. And again, it's a conversation starter. Um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Send that over to me and I'll figure out a way to uh, get something relevant into the show notes for today too. So yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Um, I like genograms. I think a lot of people who like um, do some like trust and estate planning work or if they're members of the, uh, or if they have the FBA designation, may be familiar with a version of the genogram. So I like to use that as a tool. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, use some additional symbols, but. I think back in, uh, and I think he talked about it. We had Kent on back in episode or chat, season one, sorry, uh, Kent here in Edmonton. And he had just finished FEA at the time. And he talked, I'm sure he talked about genograms in yeah. that uh, discussion. I know it's a big part of uh, the FEA, the family enterprise advisor, of course, a big part of this is just understanding the relationships between the different generations, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, now, what about situations where, and I, I don't want to uh, sort of dwell on what might not work here, but what about situations where you've dealt with somebody where you thought, I could help this person, but it, it hasn't worked out for whatever reason? Any thoughts there? Yeah. Um, so, so there were, yeah. So there were um, 
there are a couple of situations that did not go great. Uh, one of them was um, we were making some real progress, like some real progress. And, um, you know, what I did not recognize is how early they still were in their financial wellness journey. So, you know, we were only a few months in. And um, that is very, very early in the journey to undo, you know, several decades of other mindset. And so even though they were doing tremendously well, I mean, I am talking about like the ultimate, most wonderful client a person could ever ask for. They were doing tremendously well. There was um, a decision made that was not um, in their best interest. And um, there was- um, Did they you know, buy a I, boat, I Natasha? Was that what it was? Sorry? Did they buy a boat? Was that something what it was like about? that? A little more expensive than a boat, that's, but okay. um, that's my favorite. So yeah, yeah. So 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 they like they bought a yacht. Like let's call it, they bought a okay. yacht. Okay. And yeah. um, and it, I wasn't consulted prior to this decision being made, and uh, they um had made it, and we had a, a meeting, and they didn't tell me they had made it until after the next meeting that we oh. had. So that already tells me that there was some dissonance going on for them about the wisdom of their decision. And, um, um, you know, they, they did ultimately go through with that decision. Um, you know, I took it to the FDA coffee chat to get some feedback, like, you know, how can I intervene, different things. You know, I was losing literal sleep. Like, you know, my husband was wondering like why I was so out of sorts. You know, like, like, what, why is my wife acting like so much? Why is she so upset? But it was, it was a significant decision. And I was very stressed because of the financial planner side of me. Yeah. You know, that kind of decision making sort of makes it hard for me to do my financial planning job properly. So, and, and it almost seems like the client doesn't have trust in you then, right? It, you know, I would. Well, you know, so it's, there were a few things that I needed to sort of like circle back. I needed to think about like what was going on for me, why I was being triggered by this, because like, you know, so there's that self of the therapist work that is always going on. I'm not a therapist, but I'll just use that term, yeah, yeah. right? Like, so just um, why am I being so triggered? Why am I so invested in this person's outcomes? You know, like my whole business is built on respecting client autonomy and respecting them as the ultimate, um, you know, captains of their own life and their own life process. You know, what is going on for me here? You know, so I had to do all that kind of work on myself. And, um, you know, we, we've since continued, the, the decision is made and we're adapting to that decision. So learning, learning um, sort of learning points for me are that, you know, these early successes aren't linear, right? Like, so the, the success process is, is, you've all seen those graphs. Well, this was <laughs> exactly one of those graph situations. And, um, and I did exactly what I said in the beginning of this podcast that doesn't work is in my desperation, you know, I basically modeled, I spent hours, I don't even want to think about how many hours, you know, building out two plans uh, yeah. to show them decision A, right? Stay the course that we're on. Decision B, buy this yacht, right? And, and, and this yacht is not the dollar number decision you're thinking, it's about three times that when you consider taxes, opportunity costs, like, like all of, when you factor in all of those things, it's really about three times that decision, but the emotional decision for them had already been made. So at that point, me doing all of that was pointless and I needed to learn that painful lesson. Based on that then, I guess if you had that client to work with over again. Oh, I still have them. So I guess that decision with that client to work with over again, and kudos to you for staying with them, by the way, I think that a lot of people would have uh, pulled the plug at that point, but uh, how would you approach that differently? I'm sure you've thought about this a lot, right? You said you, uh, you, you do a lot of that self 
self-care, self-investigation? Yeah, yeah. And so, so how would I approach it differently? I think um, one of the things I might have asked them is whether they were feeling any discomfort or, um, you know, dissonance around their decision. Um, you know, so I might have asked that. I might have asked them, you know, what they think some of the, um, you know, potential adverse outcomes would be, you know, so, so I might've asked them, you know, like what they're thinking. Yeah, that, that's good. That, yeah. that really just figure out what's going on there and let them figure it out. Right. That's yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. And, and also just understanding that, um, that, that early success, you know, that, that early, um, those early funds that we were sort of setting aside as a buffer, their ability to perceive those funds was being impacted from the three decades prior. Right. So um, creating a mechanism via which that they could perceive, you know, what was available and what wasn't earlier in the process. And that's where the planning comes in. And this is why, it can't just be one or the other. It has to yeah. be both, Yeah. you know? Um, so, so doing that earlier in the process may have helped. It may not have helped, um, you know? Right. And I, you know, the, when you say it has to be both, I think that there is more and more recognition of that by the, the larger planning advisory community. And I'm hoping that, uh, you can give a little bit of advice for then the, and maybe advice isn't the right word here, thoughts or however you want to express it, but about what you would tell the person who's in a, like a more, I don't know, a technical or more conventional financial planning world and how that person might integrate some of what, what you're doing into their practice. Okay. Um, I think that there are a few things that um, that person should do. So First thing is something um, something that might be a little bit challenging to do, but it's I think important is to become aware of one's own money script. We all have them because the money script is just a belief, right? Like that's all it is, right? It's just a belief system, and um, it just resides in our head, you know, and and we act on it as though it is truth, you know, and and some of it is truth for us. And, and that's great. And some of it leads to good results. You know, so then we assume that, you know, because it's led to good results for us, that this rule resides in everyone else's head and it does not. So really the first thing that any advisor wanting to do this kind of work or even like to nudge into this kind of work is they have to do their own work. They have to understand what they're bringing into the room with them. You know, and so um, that, that's really step number one. And there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement that like what I'm bringing into the room is not necessarily the same thing as what the client is bringing, bringing into the room. There is a whole other belief system out there possibly in, in, in this client's mind. So I think that is, that's really step number one. Um, is to do one's own work, draw your own genogram, genogram. Um, maybe do your own KMSI or money egg or, you know, um, for yourself. So you understand your history with money and how you got to be where you are. And then after that. <laughs> a very uh, simple step, right? That's, yeah. that's very easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then after that, you can maybe, um, you know, uh, a, a good place to start would maybe be to just read like Morgan Housel's psych, Psychology of Money. That's a really great one. You know, it's, it's very approachable. You can use that with clients. Uh, Kelly McGonigal's uh, Willpower Instinct. That's another one that it's just easy to read. Um, any of Brad Quantz's work, you know, any of his books, um, I think the first couple are kind of out of print. Uh, the latest one is Money Mammoth. Um, my favorite is Mind Over Money. I haven't um, read Mind Over Money, but that's, yeah, that's fair. So. Yeah. Um, so, so those would be places to start. 
you know, and then after doing all of that, you could maybe pick up a copy of Facilitating Financial Health. Right. Which, that, to be fair, I, it's actually not a bad read. Yeah. It's what I find is the biggest impediment for a lot of people. It's like a two hundred dollar price tag on that book, right? Because it's a it's a textbook, right? So yeah. I, I, I show it to people and they're like, oh, I don't know what two hundred bucks for a book, but yeah. I think I got mine off eight books, so it might have been a little less. Eight books is my best friend, so. Right. And also a very dangerous place for me to be. <laughs> Um, now that's, so you went through that becoming more aware and then getting into some reading, any follow on steps there, anything else? Do you think that that'll cut it? That person will start just sort of, let's say quietly integrating that stuff into their practice. They may, they may not. I mean, it, there, there are a lot of regulations, you know, like, so not every advisor can, can do this. Uh, you need to learn your boundaries. And I don't mean that in a rude way, you know, we all need to understand what our boundaries and it's interesting. Um, the more you learn, the more clear those boundaries become. Um, and, um, you know, I, you know, I'm biased, but I think that any advisor wanting to do this kind of work should join the FTA. Uh, we have, um, a weekly coffee chat every third, Thursday, we call it third therapy Thursdays. <laughs> um, so it used to be monthly, then COVID, during COVID, we bumped it up to weekly and it was so uh, well received that we've just kept it every week. So there's always a group that hops on every week. Um, I've actually been pretty busy lately. I haven't been able to hop on, but there are always people there. They come from a variety of disciplines. Uh, you know, we talk about practice management, we talk about, you know, client like little things that we're trying to figure out how to help people in a more elegant way um you know it's been incredibly valuable and really really supportive we have an active facebook group um that is uh, just for members where you can post stuff uh, where you can find people like when you need to give a referral you can sort of get to know people inside the fta um i was able to get a phenomenal referral to someone overseas like you know like that I would not have been able to find elsewhere but you know it's just it just expands that network um yeah. so so I would suggest that you know we have webinars we have the conference um you know and then if you're wanting to go a little bit further you know you can take one of the programs um I know K-State and Creighton are online I don't know about Golden Gate and I know you, Georgia, isn't okay. online. So K-State and Creighton would be, or Creighton might be your options to sort of get a more robust education. FTA is coming out with some experiential learning that is going to sort of bridge the gap between theory and practice. So you learn all these theories, but then do you really want to cut your teeth on your clients? Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, that's, yeah. Yeah. And I have found a lot of value out of it. I attended last year's conference and really enjoyed it. The yeah. two-day conference last year, actually, with Morgan Housel as the uh, keynote. So yeah, yeah, that was good. And uh, inexpensive too. I I have to push this because I see a lot of other organizations where your annual dues are a thousand plus, and I think I can't remember two hundred fifty bucks a year or something like that to be an FTA member. It's very reasonable. Yeah. It is. So we are straddling. So <laughs> the pricing is always trying to find the middle ground between the therapy world and the financial world. So that's that's the other reason why our pricing might seem a little high for some people and like really reasonable to other people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we are, we're trying to bridge those two worlds to the best that we can because I, our members yeah. are coming from both worlds. I, I never thought about that, but a good chunk of your members would be dipping into like a nonprofit budget to pay for that, right? That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a fair point. So, yeah. All right. Um, do you have any last minute thoughts for us, Natasha? You've been great uh, here, but any other thoughts about the intersection of, let's say, financial coaching, therapy, planning, anything we didn't get to cover? Oh, golly. Um, probably, but nothing that is coming to mind specifically right now. Um, I'm always, you know, delighted to talk about it, but um, I think it's just, there are so many things rattling around in my head. I need a specific question to. Okay. Yeah. But no, that's great. <laughs> we, we've had a lot of specific questions and you've, you've uh, dealt with those nicely. So on that note, uh, thanks very much for joining me here today. And I'm sure that uh, 
the folks watching and listening will get a ton of value out of this. Just this uh, exposure to a whole new set of ideas. And, and I, I think it's great that you're able to talk about even where to start if you're not sure where to start with this. So. Wonderful, thanks for having me. Thank you. And just a quick note here, the uh, Natasha Knox episode is actually good for an ANS credit. I was going back through some old correspondence with the accreditation committee here in Alberta, and they are accepting uh, human behavior topics as an ANS topic. So good news, you'll have not just one life, but also one ANS credit for those in Alberta for this episode. Thanks. Okay, so Natasha went over quite a bit in the interview there. Um, and she sent me a lot of follow on she clearly thought about this a little bit after the interview, because she sent me several things that she asked if I would mention um, so much so that I actually thought about inviting her back for a follow on session. But I think I can cover it all. So she sent me a link to uh, something called MoneyGrams. I, I'm not familiar with this. I was not aware of this. Um, but just a quick survey of the paper here. It's uh, basically attaching back to childhood memories. This sounds quite useful in terms of dealing with um, your money story. So the kind of thing that can help to sort of inform that money story. The other money story related exercise she sent me was an article on Michael Kitts's website by uh, Megan Lertz, who's another very influential person in the Financial Therapy Association. And this is the money egg exercise. So you'll find the links to both money grams and your money story in the show notes for today. And then she asked about the uh, sort of, and she said it's stigma, and that's a good way to put it, I think. I don't think I used that word, but I think it's a good way to think about it. The stigma around a financial planner referring somebody to a therapist. And what Natasha emphasizes here in her follow-on comments is that she really likes to normalize the sort of team approach to say, look, you're going to have all these folks who are focused on helping you be the best version of you. Each team member is going to have different strengths. And one of those team members might be a therapist. And this is a, a little bit of a question also of do as I say, um, where Natasha actually, sorry, do as I do, I suppose. Natasha actually does um, use a therapist herself. And I think that that's a good lesson to take away here, that if you're looking to apply these kinds of things, uh, maybe better to use some of them yourself. They're classic, you know, you pull up to a Ford dealer and you want to see a bunch of Fords in the employee parking lot. Um, Natasha also mentioned the uh, a few programs here, and actually one included on this list is what originally got me uh, down the path of the real value of this kind of work, and that's uh, Susan Bradley at Sudden Money Institute, the Certified Financial Tra Transitionist Program. Uh, Susan was a speaker at Financial Planning Week, which is upcoming here mid-November. Um, Susan was a speaker at Financial Planning Week maybe four or five years ago, and was one of a uh, a long run then of uh, sort of behavior slash therapy focused planners that uh, FP Canada brought in. I really like the work that Susan does here. And she does have this uh, certified financial transitionist program. Uh, the original one, and one that I kind of regret not having a better knowledge of, very famous in the United States, and I know a few Canadians have used it, and that's uh, George Kinder's Registered Life Planner Program. Uh, this is a program that helps with uh, what uh, the Kinder program calls the interior uh, part of finances. That's the stuff that's sort of internal to you. And the Kinder program, interestingly, predates some of what we see today in terms of, let's say, field research. But I still think is uh, it, it just a lot of what's in there um, is that sort of practical experience that mirrors the lessons learned from research. And one, again, that I don't know is Sandra Davis's financial fitness coach uh, certification. So lots out there, lots of interesting stuff. And a few more notes here from Natasha. Um, so she just wanted to comment a little bit on the money egg. And I think this is a good lesson overall, is that exercises like the money egg or getting a handle on your money story, uh, because you're delving into this area of sort of therapeutic work, you really can do some harm here if you don't have a good grounding. So I wouldn't suggest you just want to integrate this. And even she talked about in the interview, Natasha mentioned 
the uh, clients money script inventory. And that's, it's a great tool. I like going through it. I often show financial planners it in the core curriculum. Uh, but my caution here is that just sort of integrating that kind of thing into your uh, planning cold uh, might scare clients off or might um, do things like uh, bring traumas to light. So we wanna be a little bit cautious here about um, putting that stuff in without a little bit of background knowledge. And uh, Natasha said her sort of must read here is the uh, Brad Klontz book, Facilitating Financial Health, which is an excellent book, um, well worth the, uh, the price you pay for it. Um, and Natasha also mentions, I said she had a lot to, to add in here, um, the uh, IFS, this is Internal Family Systems, and she specifically mentions a book by uh, Dick Schwartz here called Internal Family Systems. So there's uh, something there. And also mentions that um, the Quant's Money Script Inventory, and I like this kind of thing, uh, it gets, it, it's a little bit dated now in some ways. And so there's a change in language here where what used to be called money worship in KMSI is now called money focus. And the uh, problem here, of course, is that worship, it's a, it's a very weighted word. It carries a lot with it. Uh, and we wanna be careful about that kind of thing. Um, we don't want to, let's say, impart values on people when we're describing how they might perceive something or how they might behave. We would rather, I think, keep that fairly neutral. So that's the change from money worship. And I think I have to go change this in my textbooks too now to money focus. The number for today's episode is five. The number for today's episode is five. Now, Natasha mentioned our mutual acquaintance. I hope he considers me a friend, uh, Sean Maslick. Sean is a financial planner here in Edmonton, and he hosts a podcast that I really enjoy called The Most Hated F Word. I've spoken about it here before, and I'm going to link to an episode where he interviews Moira Summers, somebody whom I have a ton of respect for. And uh, if you listen to, maybe there's three or four other episodes that I could highlight here, but there's a few where he talks specifically about helping to identify your money story. And if you sort of go back to the uh, Moira Summers episode, and uh, just to show this is all connected, Moira actually, I got to know her sort of via Susan Bradley, um, although Moira's uh, close by in Winnipeg and Susan is in Florida, but that's how that goes. Um, but yeah, Sean does a great job with a, a ton of um, money story stuff. So I would encourage you to delve into that if you find this interesting. Um, Sean's podcast, The Most Stated F Word, is, it, it's not, I would suggest, sort of specifically designed for financial planners. I would describe it more as general interest, but he has a ton of stuff on there that is relevant for um, financial planners. I did want to comment on a couple of things because we're on this topic of behavioral finance and there's something that showed up in the news and I've seen it a couple places now. And this is around uh, Dan Ariely's research. So Dan Ariely is well known as a financial or a behavioral finance researcher. Um, and he's, uh, I'm going to say generally well-respected, although it's going to put a little bit of a, a cloud over this. So there's been this kind of question I would suggest over the last decade or so, and this is something I've heard uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's kind of the pioneer in the field, talk about freely. There's just been this question about the replicability of some of the well-known studies in behavioral finance. And because uh, Dan Ariely is one of these researchers, I think this led people to go and try and duplicate that research. And uh, notably what happened here is there's a, a question that was put before uh, Dan by an insurer as to whether people are more or less likely to lie on an insurance application based on where questions about honesty show up in that application. And it turns out, and I don't know who the source of this is, I imagine it'll figure out eventually, but it, it turns out that there's a well-known study that really influenced a lot of how a ton of insurers globally uh, started presenting information to their clients uh, that was based on some data that came from an insurer, or at least here's the story, 
to uh, an aerial ace lab and then got turned into uh, a research paper. But some folks looking at that, uh, some other researchers unrelated to Professor Ariely said, uh, you know, there's a problem with this data. And there's all kinds of things we can do here. This is actually a, a tool you see used in, um, in audit and in forensic accounting. And that's the idea that there's certain numbers that show up more frequently. If you take whatever, a million pieces of data, the number one should actually show up more frequently than any other digit. So this is often where you can pick a randomized data set versus a, uh, uh, a sort of made up data set. So there's uh, concepts like that that we see applied here. And anyways, these researchers said that is a, a fake set of data. And a bunch of people who worked on that paper, including Professor Ariely himself, have said, yeah, it turns out that there is something wrong with it. And now we have this, uh, this kind of mea culpa being issued. And I wanted to address this because we do use a lot of this kind of research in um, financial planning. And I don't think that this is a reason to back off. I think that what it should say though is, look, we need a good number of researchers doing this research, trying to duplicate results. And we can't take just one uh, research paper by itself and say, hey, that's definitive. That describes how people behave. You even see this a little bit with um, how the papers themselves are written. It's very normal that we say the, the sort of headline is that people are going to behave a certain way. And then if you delve into the research, it's often that uh, out of 100 people, maybe 35 people behave a certain way and the other 65 are sort of scattered across a bunch of different behaviors, or maybe 55 people behave a certain way. And we say, well, most people behave that way. Well, okay, from a researcher's perspective, that's gonna be true, but you have to sometimes dig in a little bit further than that. Now, I know some people recoiled when I said in the interview that I'm not a big fan of personality typing and I, I specifically commented on Kobe A, and that's fine. I, I don't mean to be critical of that particular tool. I know that some people do really like that, or you might talk about um, BISC, or you might talk about uh, Myers-Briggs, whatever the personality typing is. And the challenge I have here, and this kind of ties into my comments a moment ago about Dan Ariely's research, is that we're still really in relatively early days for let's say lab-based psychology results. Now, what is generally accepted by those who work in, let's say the, the science area of psychology is that there are five personality traits by which we can measure somebody. And this is um, really something that, again, we have to take this with a grain of salt if they know how to apply these tools, which I don't, I would not suggest that I'm any kind of um, expert or anything close to it in this area. Um, but I would suggest that if we're going to talk about personality typing, it's better to base it on uh, the research that's out there rather than some of the, um, let's say, uh, semi-science-based or sort of pseudoscience that we see floating around out there. So the five areas we see here are neuroticism, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion and agreeableness. And these are used by psychologists. They're at least perceived to cross cultural boundaries. I even actually had a discussion once with a researcher who was working with uh, SEALs, if I remember right. And she was using three of these personality traits, if I remember correctly, with, uh, with SEALs to sort of measure the personalities of SEALs. I don't know if that's a, a good research or not. I found it very interesting anyways that the uh, the big five, those are normally called the big five personality traits, that that was useful, uh, not just in uh, human interactions, but uh, quite a bit uh, outside of those uh, conversations as well. And um, the uh, base uh, research for this does date back to 1949, but because you have a whole bunch of different research and sort of forks in the road happening along the way, I don't know how recently this has become kind of the dominant way of thinking about this. And the fact that we still have a bunch of other tools available out there, it does tell me that there's still maybe a mixed bag of, uh, let's say, perceptions about this type of thing. 
Okay, I hope that that was uh, useful. I hope that we learned something from the discussion with Natasha. I know I did. I really enjoyed that conversation. I feel like uh, Natasha is one of the folks I've spoken to here who really has been able to integrate that, that whole field of um, human behavior into her financial planning practice. And I'd like you to think about whether or not that's appropriate for you. I don't think everybody needs to do that. As Natasha mentions in here, uh, we do have ample opportunity for that team approach. And it might just be a matter of recognizing when something that you're dealing with is beyond your scope and saying, hey, it's time to bring in somebody like Natasha. Not that that's it. The uh, Financial Therapy Association has a whole directory of people who can help with those kinds of problems. Thank you very much. We'll see you again in two weeks and enjoy your continued studies.